Okay. So, uh, I obviously have to take advantage of the uh, name that we used for our project. So, anytime I can talk about uh, the path forward, I will not uh, miss the opportunity. So, uh, and I also, uh, I don't know if it's an, I don't. I, okay, I will apologize. Uh, uh, some of what I'm going to talk about is repeating uh, the, the bring your own capacity presentation earlier today. Uh, my goal is here to represent with Brian Flynn. He calls us the management. So now uh, you heard earlier from the trenches, from the people who do the work. Now I will talk about it from from, uh, from the, the management uh, perspective. Let me see if, uh, okay. It, uh, yeah. I'll make get it. Okay, so so this, this is a slide that I showed you yesterday. And uh, again, the message is uh, we are in year two of the fast project that was, that is funded by, by the, by the NSF, the Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure. And it brings together the OIG Consortium. You will hear later today in this section, a session, uh, Frank, uh, who is the executive director of the uh, OIG. And uh, you can say that I am here talking in terms uh, representing the, the CHTC, the Center for Hyperbolic Computing. And the, the past partnership has two components. One is a fabric of services that are coming through the OEG consortium. Uh, Brian Buckelman is in charge or is being blamed for, for everything that goes wrong there. And the vision of these services is that they are being used to establish a whole bunch of distributed high throughput computing environment, where most of them, actually with the exception of Atlas, are a HD condo pool. So you have the services, the services allow these different organizations with the nice uh, uh, logos here to build their own HD condo pools and uh, to use them according to their to their rules. So that is the 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 OEG uh, fabric of services, and then we have the HD condo software suite that is coming from. CHTC, which is the technology part, the software part that actually feeds into the services provided by the OEG and everyone else, including industry. And uh, we heard yes uh, earlier today, uh, potential users uh, through the, the Google Cloud and 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 what have you. So, so that's that's where we are on uh, on this. Now, an important part of it is that the, the path vision, and obviously part of the reason why we are funded to do what we do is because we are aligned with the NSF cyber infrastructure vision. And I would say that we are also doing our best to influence this vision because I think everyone will agree that this is an ongoing process of how do we get to an evolving national cyber infrastructure uh, uh, a blueprint. So uh, we, we had uh, Eric Wilcott give the talk uh, yesterday, decided way before we knew about the EHD results, but last week or two weeks ago, or it was only like, yeah, two weeks ago, 
we got this, this amazing result. And it, what is important as a take home for the purpose of this discussion is that they had to run 5 million simulations in order to get this beautiful picture. And by the way, it also used 20 million co-hours. And they used the OSD fabric of services to do all this. Actually, over three months, they have accomplished all that. And when I visited part of the group at Harvard uh, last week, and ask them a simple question that, you know, I ask everyone, you did 5 million, why not 50 million? And they admitted that their science would have been better if they could make 50 million, because when they have more points, they have to do less extrapolation. And since you can all imagine that these systems are nonlinear, then, Extrapolation in nonlinear system is not, is not the most accurate technique. But the answer was manpower, people power. And what I want to do today with the time that I have talking about the access point is really to address the people power challenge and how we can do better, how can we get them to 50 million or to 500 million or whatever the next number is. So our paper, you know, that we got all these awards and all the gazillion references from uh, the, the 80s was about Kondo, the hunter of idle workstation. Yes, we started by talking about how do we get all this capacity and bring it to the researcher. I think we have to write the 2022 paper on HTCSS about the manager of high throughput computing work. So it's not the capacity, it is the management of the workload. Going from five to 50 to 500. And the way that I'm trying to communicate it to people who are not uh, understanding what's the difference between a million core hours and two million core hours is that there is a difference between a shopping list that has uh, 10 items on it or a shopping list that has 5 million items on it or a to-do list that has 10 items on it and a to-do list that has five or 50 or 500 million items on it. And that is the problem of managing high supercomputing uh, workloads. If I can, did it stop working? No, okay. So let me again repeat the terminology because it, it is important that we, as we move forward on paths, we also get our terminology organized because terminology is important. And I told uh, uh, Todd Miller that I want us to move away from using the word pilot and to talk about either execution point or gliding, because it has a meaning which is beyond just uh, a, a name. So the main thing is that researchers place their workload at an access point. The access point is the place where, sorry for going back to my old tradition of thousands of years ago, is where you bring your offering. That's where you place the workload. That's the place you trust when you have your workload and say, here it is, do it. And the workload is not just the job, the workload is all the data around it. And hopefully we'll have time to talk about it. And then there is the execution point, which is attached to some resource that is going to execute a job uh, out there. And 
the relationship is that the access point is using an execution point in order to get the capacity that the execution point can bring to, to the access point. And the important thing is that uh, from the days of uh, that we started in uh, for Condor G is that we can use an access point to delegate the execution to another battery. So there is a fundamental difference between the access point saying, I am going to execute it on an execution point that I know and I understand the, the protocols and, and all the kind of thing, which is within the HTCSS versus the access point taking the job and handing it over to another batch system and saying, work on it and let me know when you are when you are done. And the in terms of the terminology, I I would like us to talk about an HD condo pool, which is a collection of execution points, and an access point that when deployed together form an HD condo system is the way that we always talked about having a condo system out there where we did everything together. And the idea of the HD condo software suite is that each of these pieces is an element in the, in the suite. Now, let me stress clearly that when I talk about an access point, I don't mean just a SCADI. There's much more that has to be available in order to serve as an access point. And let me just uh, mention uh, yesterday, uh, Ryan talked about uh, the credit. Okay, somebody is managing your credential. This is not the schedule, it is another entity that has to be at the access point. And, and I don't want to even start talking about, about data. Uh, so in OSG, we are, one of the services is to provide access points. They go through the OSG Connect service and it, allows any researcher in the US, and here is a call for everyone around here to go and use it, to get access to the access point and to use it, to bring their workload, their high throughput computing workload to, to the access point. It provides storage for input output. It supports workload uh, workflow management services, Dagman or um, Pegasus. And I, I hope, and we have here a discussion with uh, Rob Quick from, from Indiana, is to put in more science gateways that are, you, uh, that are the, the front uh, door to the access point as far as the research is concerned. And uh, we, we, at the moment, we have an affinity between an account and an access point. So when you get an account established, and that's another thing that uh, we have been talking and, and I will try to use it as, as I move. Obviously I will not cover all my slides today. Uh, that, that Brian is, is pushing for is to stop talking about identities and talk about accounts, which is actually what you see in, in uh, the cloud world. Uh, they don't care who you are, they care what your account is. So let's get it going. So the other part is which you heard earlier today is the open science pool which is a place where institutions can bring their capacity to be shared across the science and engineering community at the national level. 
They do it for various reasons. Part of it because they're part of the TC Star project. Part of it is because they believe that sharing what they have with the community is the right thing to do. This is another service that actually creates uh, an HD condo pool out of this, out of these execution points. And it provides a fair share access to all these researchers. So if you are getting an account, you get fair share access to whatever is in the open science. You don't need an allocation, you don't need an assignment, you don't need credit, you, you just get access to it. And you will hear later from Brian and from Frank about how all this relates to the Open Science Data Federation. So here is some numbers about the OS pool, but also the way I would like us always to talk about what we do. And the important thing here is at the top, I'm saying that in a typical week, we are moving 90 million files. On a top, typical week, we are serving 2 million jobs. And yes, on a typical week, we are doing 2 million co-hours. It's useful to have the co-hours, but they should always be at the bottom of the list. Because the real challenge is, how do you move 90 million? The key challenge is how do you serve 2 million jobs? Yes, we want to see more users. Yes, we want to see more projects. We have to deal with more access points. And yes, it's wonderful to have up to 40K cores in, in this environment. But the key is there is a lot of moving parts here. There are people who make a big deal if they move 90 million files, we do it in one HD condo pool uh, in one week. So how does it all connect to, to the NSF side? So here is, is, is a presentation from the director of the Office of uh, Advanced Cyber Infrastructure, Kevin's boss, uh, earlier this month, uh, this year, sorry. And the important message here is that it's coming from, from Washington. And a term, by the way, that I used in my slides for, for, over, for almost two decades is the concept of democratization of access. And now it is of interest and concern is how do we bring all this? And, and I would say that the the, the beauty of what we do in HTCSS is that we democratize in both directions. We democratize in the access and the management of the HTC workload that hopefully makes it easier for any researcher to run 5 million jobs. But we also uh, do it through our execution point where we enable organization to pull together the computing capacity. So if you look at the OS pool on one side and you look at the access points on the other side, these are two forces that are moving into the direction of democratization. You don't have to go and buy a 10 million machine to, to pull together the, the capacity. And when uh, Manish has been talking about from go to action, he pointed out the pilot that we have been running as part of the path project. And the idea of the, of the pilot was actually to show what um, Matt and, uh, and Todd presented to you earlier today is about bring your own capacity. Is how can we use a single access point to run a specific workload of a specific researcher at CMU. And the key is all these different uh, sources of capacity that were brought by the researcher. 
Now, one of them is the, the, the open science pool that is fair share. And you know, if we had more time, we can talk more about it, but you saw how it worked from the earlier presentation today. The basic idea here is that you have the access point that is where the, the researcher comes. Now, if the researcher comes directly to the access point or comes to the access point via a science gateway is a detail at some level. And I think that the presentation that we heard from NERV is another example where basically Taylor uh, created an access point. And while you can go from the access point and the fair share to the open science pool, where you don't, it's not your capacity. All these other things in the circle are going through the layer of bring your own capacity. Whether it's a Google Cloud, or whether it's an allocation, or whether it's credit uh, in the path facility, all this is being brought to the access point, and from there, we we take care of things and. Obviously, the access point has to, to, to manage all this. And I, I don't have time to talk about it, about uh, the past facility, but uh, the, the, the news are that part of past today, we have capacity that we manage that can be used to serve researchers that get assigned capacity as part of their award. And here's a dear colleague letter that expresses all this for those of you here who would like to get guaranteed access, follow the, the, the dear colleague letter. So it, let me use the, the minutes I don't have to sort of send the, the, the higher level message about the access point. So these are the black and white days. The, the picture is still colored here. And, uh, you know, you have Jim there and you have Todd there. And it, Jim Prine is there also. So it means it is 95, 94, because he graduated in 96. So it's, uh, 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 and then it's actually our colleagues from, from Mika were also there uh, working at the time of, uh, I think it was part of the folder project. But, the, the key thing was that uh, all I.O. happened at the access point. And what this means is that the user identity and file name were all tied to the local operating system. The, all the names, everything was local. And we also did not manage account information. We said account information is managed by the operating system. We, can, we are keeping track of an association between the workload and the account information, but we didn't manage the, the account information. And all the past names were all local. Because the idea was that you're running on your workstation and you give it to Kondo, it all looks as if you're running on your workstation because all the I.O. went back and forth. Even all the, the date and the timing, we, we had all, all the issues of how do I make the job feel that it's running on the local machine. And all access control were based on your Unix identity and later on to, to your window. So at the time, the access point was in full control over everything, except for the account. I will steal a few minutes. Except for the account that were delegated to the operating system. Now, what happened for a lot of reasons and a lot of forces is we moved to the point where the access point became less knowledgeable of file access and account 
identity and namespaces became global. And we can blame whatever, but we are not here in the blame game. And what we need to do is to bring it back that we, we have to get to the point where we bring all the identity and the namespace back to the access point, but we also have to move forward and bring account management to the access point. Because what we did was that the access point has no ability to make decisions about accounts. All the account information is delegated to the metro. And, and we are paying a hefty price for it. There are a lot of things that we need to do at the access point level, and we cannot do it because the access point doesn't know anything about the count. It just maps the, 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 the local operating system uh, information to, to, the, uh, to the account. And the it's also that the access point does not provide a unified view of all stored uh, job records. We have a queue, we have history, we have unmaterialized, we have to be materialized, we have maybe materialized. And it's not something that I can come in and say, tell me about what's going on with my workload. Even though we conceptually have a database of all the records of all the, the jobs, but it's not built in, in into the way that we treat the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the information that we have about the job. And we definitely don't provide any aggregated information uh, about accounts with the exception of what uh, Jason has been recently doing for us and revolutionize the way that we are treating the, the open science board. So uh, uh, this is uh, a call for, for on that we must make the access point more capable, more informed about the IO. You will hear later from, from uh, Greg Sane about the, the, the evil of script. Of, of wrappers. The main problem with these wrappers is that information that the access point needs to know, the access point doesn't know. And it's downhill from there. Because if we have to present this information to a science gateway, the access point needs to know it. And we need to be more knowledgeable about the workload. What do you need? How? You know, I, I mean, we can go all the way to to what uh, Dot Sane presented. You know, all the dynamic behavior of memory. This is information that should be at the access point because this is the one that has the intimate relationship with with the workload. And uh, we have to make it more usable. Maybe science gateways are an important part in it, and we have to do a better job in supporting reports. So my promise is that we will do it. And we are determined to do it. And this is my final slide. And I'm what, uh, seven and a half minutes over? Thank you. <laughs>